Section 2. The Principles of Soul Evolution. Part A. Healing and Self-Transformation. Chapter 21. Self and God. In an infinite creator, there is only unity. As we start Section 2, Principles of Soul Evolution, let's begin at the beginning and ask some central questions. For starters, who are you? At an essential level, looking into the space of silence, what really is a human being? And for that matter, who or what is God? These are perhaps the central questions of our life, forever asked, never answered. Yet, if we truly seek meaning, we must keep asking until the answers become self-evident. Western religions tell us that man is small and God is great, that human beings live in error while God is perfection, and apparently so far away. A great gulf is said to separate us from the Absolute, while at the same time most people struggle with inner conflict and self-esteem. Yet these two are related. Our notions of Godhead determine the wholeness of our sense of self. More precisely, the perceived gulf between humanity and God creates and sustains self-denial, since it is no less than a projection of a perceived inner schism. When we do not appreciate who we are, God seems far away, yet when the self with a capital S is fully known, we feel the power of the Absolute within us. The kingdom of heaven is within. Of course, according to all mystic traditions, the personal experience of both separation from God and psychological self-conflict are simply issues of awareness. There is no cosmic law that binds us to an experience of duality, opposition, and estrangement from our source. When mystics speak of unity, or when E.T. Watkins and wanderers tell us to trust ourselves and listen to the inner voice, they're really trying to help us shift our awareness. We need to realize that everything depends on the quality of our self-understanding, since our vision of ourselves largely determines our experience. Looking within, if we only see problems, confusion, and failure, then life is miserable. Looking outside, if we imagine a punishing, indifferent creator, or an absolute that can only be accessed through strict conduct, then we end up controlling our natural process without appreciating what we really are. Massive self-denial often lurks behind these apparently spiritual notions. Many of us striving for higher consciousness while working on ourselves and helping others can be intensely self-critical. We may see our faults clearly, but if that is all we see, then we are deceiving ourselves. Ceaseless self-reproach is a potent glamour, as destructive to spiritual progress as pride and vanity. Many kind and caring people shackle themselves with self-criticism, ranging all the way from chronic feelings of inadequacy to severe self-hatred and long-term depression. For the seeker of gnosis, or direct knowledge of the Absolute, understanding self and God goes far beyond simply appreciating our basic goodness while acknowledging imperfections. We should understand that spiritual growth goes far deeper than achieving emotional balance. That is just the beginning, not the end of the line. One of the greatest Sufi teachers, Jalaluddin Rumi, sang of his own search, quote, I tried to find him on the Christian cross, but he was not there. I went to the temple of the Hindus and to the old pagodas, but I could not find a trace of him anywhere. I searched on the mountains and in the valleys, but neither in the heights nor in the depths was I able to find him. I went to the Kaaba in Mecca, but he was not there either. I questioned the scholars and philosophers, but he was beyond their understanding. I then looked into my heart, and it was there where he dwelled that I saw him. He was nowhere else to be found. End quote. When Rumi sings of finding God within the heart, He's really pointing towards eternal truth, cosmic fact, reality as it is. What he realized can also be phrased this way. The Creator is within the heart because self and God are forever one. Without further qualification, can we really accept this, or must we only see ourselves through the limitations of body and mind? Our degree of non-enlightenment can be measured by the extent to which we identify ourselves with conditioned patterns of personality, addictions, fears, and conflicts. A quick way to gauge your own degree of self-acceptance is to just observe your feelings upon reading the passage above. If you feel doubt, apathy, denial, or confusion, 
then those are your immediate obstructions or obstacles to divine embrace. Of course, the blossoming of God in the heart is more than just an idea. It is an experience that can't really be expressed in words at all. Going further, we can examine some other models of self. Theosophy and ageless wisdom teach us that human beings are composed of interlaced forces and energies. Although most of us consider ourselves a personality, this is just considered the material shell that contains such forces. Alice Bailey, in Esoteric Psychology 2, explains further, quote, The three personality types of energy are the etheric, which is the vehicle of vital energy, the astral body, which is the vehicle of feeling energy, and the mental, which is the vehicle of the intelligent energy of will. However, these three energies are not the entire human body or the entire human being. All religions teach that there is a soul or spirit which gives life to the personality, since personality is merely a vehicle for the divine expression of soul. The driver is none other than higher self. And what is the alternative? We are simply a bag of biology? When I ask atheists if this is really how they define themselves, they are hard-pressed to agree, and they usually do not answer. I feel sorry for the hardliners who do agree. The soul itself recoils from saying, Yes, I am a bag of meaningless molecules. The raw material gives a far more complete definition of the human being. According to Ra, we are a mind-body-spirit-beingness-totality complex guided by higher self, which is a mouthful, not surprising from Ra. We may think of ourselves as simply people, a humble term indeed, but this only scratches the surface. Just as the ocean cannot be fully known by its waves, likewise a human being is far more than what is visible. Our life on earth is one slice of the infinite. Our normal sense of identity is but a partial awareness of a greater self. Why do I say this? Not only from over 6,000 years of Oriental philosophy, but also, more importantly, from my own personal experience. Yet, the universe is an interesting place, and if we don't want to see the entirety of our being, cosmic forces won't force us to. Higher self, guides, angels, and benevolent ETs may send us love and light, but we are totally free to reject their blessings. Humans on Earth usually choose a more distorted way of seeing themselves, identifying with only the personality, and sometimes with only the physical body, rather than recognizing a greater self which must exist in unity. When we start to talk about self with a capital S, we are not far from appreciating oneness. Neither E.T. wanderers nor benevolent visitors in the skies Neither guides nor angelic helpers will force upon us a vision of unity. As I continue my travels and teachings around the world, it strikes me rather hard that humanity as a whole is far indeed from appreciating oneness. What does Ra mean by saying that, quote, in an infinite creator there is only unity, end quote? Opening a door to the majesty of true nature, at the very least it means the following. Human beings and absolute Godhead are essentially the same. There is no essential separation, and the idea or experience of separation is really an illusion based on limited perception. All beings, including Buddhas, masters, people, plants and animals, ETs, good and bad, angels, suns and galaxies, are fundamentally one being. Divinity, or what we call absolute Godhead, is the essence of all things seen and unseen. Each speck of dust is the infinite creator, not a part of the divine, but the whole divine. The two cosmic paths of unity through love and separation, or one path through love and the other of separation through control, are a single expression of one being. Positive and negative ET groups express one life. Past, present, and future exist simultaneously in a timeless eternal present, always available and accessible if we have eyes to see. Omniscience and omnipotence are our true nature. Our perceptions of spatial relativity and apparently separate places, the assumption of a real difference between here and there, is also an illusion. Everywhere is here. Every thought and fantasy we generate creates a genuine, infinite reality in some dimension. The relative imperfections we see in ourselves exist completely fused in harmony with our total perfection, right now and for all times. There is no real spiritual path. Hard to swallow? We cannot die, since our true nature is the body of infinite cosmos. Our mind is eternal, and awareness is eternal. 
So-called change and transformation are illusory in the reality of oneness. All we see and all we experience is none other than our true self. There is only one actor on the universal stage, the infinite one, who is Godhead or self, the creator of all, and that's you. All thoughts and concepts describing the Absolute are inadequate, and you can burn this book now. There's really nothing to worry about, except perhaps paying your bills. Does all this sound abstract? Well, then try a few lifetimes of intensive meditation. Until then, perhaps we can look to the words of William Blake, who simply said that, quote, If the doors of perception were cleansed, we would see reality as it is, infinite. End quote. Only with new eyes can we really see and know who and what is the Supreme, and with this vision we will truly understand oneness as well as our own true being. All words and teachings can only point towards this reality and at best inspire us to keep on keeping on and continue our expansion to boundless awareness. In the next chapter, we will look at the basic fuel that allows us to drive along the bridge to infinite being, which is the will.